Welcome back to the Majority Report. Joining us now is Ben Burgess. He's author of Give Them an Argument, Logic for the Left, available for pre-order. It's published by Zero Books. He also teaches philosophy and logic at Rutgers University. He can be seen regularly on the Zero Books channel, a uh, YouTube channel, uh, doing uh, logical deconstruction of right-wing arguments. You can also hear him on many different podcasts, including in a weekly segment on TMBS called The Debunk, which you can find on that YouTube channel as well. Ben, thanks so much for doing this. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Doing well. Um, make sure that when I talk, there isn't a little bit of an echo. Uh, I think it should be fine, though, but just make sure. Um, so, Ben... Let's start by setting the parameters of this book. I guess, you know, if you're like uh, me and I think us generally here, I guess as much as I hate to admit it, we probably do use logic and facts in our argumentation. Uh, but we also have been so put off. Brave of you to admit that. Yeah, it doesn't feel good to admit, <laughs> but I guess it's true. Uh, but there's also the fact that these uh, words and probably a lot of words that are actually, you know, <laughs> signify pretty good things like, I don't know, or phrases like freedom of speech or sure. Like, God forbid, even like open exchange of ideas. These are actually <laughs> very defensible concepts uh, in not just a liberal uh, sense, in a socialist sense, in a, uh, a very broad, I mean, if you read Amartya Sen, he wrote a great book called The Argumentative Indian. I mean, these are tools that you could find literally in any culture on earth uh, for, you know, basically hum human communication and, and sort of figuring things out. They have been totally toxified by the sort of modern internet right wing, obviously most famously figures around the IDW and, you know, propaganda figures like Ben Shapiro. How did these words become toxified in popular discourse? And what do you mean when you use, when not only when you use this, but when you actually teach it I mean, you teach it professionally? Yeah. So I think one of the big villains there, uh, you know, long before the IDW was Ayn Rand, uh, who made a really big deal about logic all the time. Although, uh, like so, for example, uh, in her book Atlas Shrugged, the the sections of the book are named after these basic logical principles, like the law of non contradiction. And there's always this vague implication that if you like understood enough about logic or you cared enough about logic, you would agree with Ayn Rand about you know capitalism and why socialism is bad and uh, why altruism is bad and all those things even though there's there's really no connection whatsoever which uh which is also something that carries forward to the guys you're talking about like um IDW figures like uh Ben Shapiro um who you know who makes a big deal about logic the New York Times uh, famously called him the destroyer of weak arguments uh and which by the way how did a, that make through a copy edit sorry tan <laughs> go ahead the destroyer <laughs> no, of weak arguments that would definitely have gotten a red circle in an undergraduate paper. <laughs> it would. And one of the things that uh, somebody like me would write at the margins is uh, if you're going to make this claim, I'd really like to see some examples. Uh, <laughs> right. And there aren't a lot, right? So for example, in that article, just go on that tangent for a second, uh, the only example that you actually get in that article, it's called The Cool Kids Philosopher about Ben Shapiro, uh, of him destroying a weak argument, is he's at a Q&A on a college campus, and uh, this 22-year-old girl, 22 girl is challenging him in the Q&A about his position on trans rights. Uh, and he says, hey, how old are you? And she says, oh, I'm, I'm 22. And he says, oh, could, could you just identify as being 60 and she's flustered for a second and then he kind of bulldozes over her and talks over her and makes his point and so if this is like what you do right you know you you know you're the destroyer of weak arguments and the standout example is that you like momentarily flustered a 22 year old so she wasn't quite sure what to say about your silly analogy right. then that doesn't really seem like you're you're backing up the claim 
which is one of the reasons I think it is important to uh, to detoxify this language, because right now a lot of people on the right get a lot of mileage just out of saying the words, right? You know, they use these almost like magic incantations, facts and Ironically. logic, logic, facts, you know, yeah, exactly. So, you know, logic, facts, and evidence. Uh, even though oftentimes they're very confused about, like, what these words even mean. Uh, very often, the sort of people that you run into, anybody who's ever argued about politics a lot on social media, uh, has run into your kind of basement-dwelling uh, libertarian trolls who love to throw around accusations of logical fallacies, and they love to do it in, like, this really rapid fire way, right? Like that's what's really impressive for them, that they can do the instant diagnosis of what's wrong with your argument. Now, when I talk about reclaiming logic for the left, that means two things. One of them is showing what's wrong with these right-wing arguments, and oftentimes they are actually very bad arguments because they can coast by because so few people push back on them uh, in the way, you know, at least in the ways that I'm suggesting that they should. Uh, and, you know, that we make more explicit arguments for our positions, but also reclaiming the way of doing logic. Because if you're just kind of listening to what somebody says and coming up with this snap judgment about what's wrong with it, then you aren't really carefully thinking about it. Uh, and so if the point of these tools, right, the kinds of things, you know, you mentioned that I would teach in a class like a logic, reasoning, and persuasion class at Rutgers, uh, so if the point of, of these tools is to just be like a way of scoring points, you know, and, you know, making, you know, making yourself look impressive to, you know, your fellow trolls and, uh, uh, and, and making people feel flustered or unsure what to say, then sure, that's a good way of doing it. But if the purpose of these tools is to reason better, so you're more likely to get things right, then that's exactly the wrong way to do it. Well, let's, okay. And then you also have this critique, which I, I think, I mean, a lot of us uh, fall into in various ways, but I think it's true that like both snark and moral condemnation are totally valid modes of communication, but they can't be the only modes. And the left has kind of fallen into a sort of over-reliance on those two tactics, which I agree. I've, I've been persuaded by you. So then let's go back to the Ben Shapiro yeah. example. Cause my impulse when I read that is to make fun of his voice and just call him a transphobic twerp and move <laughs> on. Explain why yeah. that analogy is bad. Why, why, why is actually the tactic that he used to fluster that woman, why is that actually not rigorous argumentation? Yeah, so when you talk about um, gender and gender identity, like the, the small part that he's right about is that one internally consistent way is to use words like man, woman, gender, etc., is to mean like to use the word woman to mean anybody who's uh, chromosomally female and is an adult uh, human, uh, and you know use the word man to mean biologically male uh, adult human, and that's one internally consistent way of using using those words. But of course, it's not the only internally consistent way of using those words. Uh, that you know we can you know because obviously there are people who use them consistently and coherently in this other way to talk about gender identity and gender expression. Right. Uh, and, you know, an analogy that I find really useful uh, that's, that's not original to me, uh, but comes from a uh, trans uh, woman who uh, is a uh, philosophy professor, Sophie Grace Chappelle, uh, at least that's what I've seen it, uh, is to adoptive parents. So one internally consistent way of using the word parent is to exclusively refer to something biological. Mm -hmm. that, uh, so, you know, the, or words like mother or father, you know, that's the sense in which we use these words in a sentence like the DNA test came, you know, came back and you're not the father. Uh, but Sorry. <laughs> as I'm sure you've heard many times oh, before, okay. you know, it's your oh, great yeah. relief. Okay. Okay. Uh, uh, but, uh, <laughs> but yeah, and, um, but like uh, clearly another consistent way of using these words is to refer to somebody who has the legal or social role of a parent. Uh, and you can insist on, on just using it in your preferred way. Like, you know, we can imagine, um, you know, we can imagine some bizarrely bigoted uh, school principal who refused to allow adoptive parents to participate in parent teacher conferences because, uh, 
you know, because parent has a biological definition and that's just what the word means. Right. Facts don't care about your feelings. Right. Uh, but, you know, clearly there's nothing about um, the, bio, you know, the biological facts or logical consistency that dictates that choice. That's a lot less obvious in the case of age that there's an internally consistent uh, way of using words like 60 or 22 that's not tied to chronology in the same way. There might be. Some people make that argument, but I don't think we can just assume that, right? That they have, and there are certainly some obvious disanalogies, like many trans people, not all of them, but, uh, but many trans people will talk about having, you know, like if uh, somebody uh, is a trans woman, they might talk about having always known they were a woman. And I'm not sure that it's coherent to say that you always knew you were 60 years old, right? It mm -hmm. seems like part of what's built into being 60 is that before that you were 59, you were 58. And just to tie this into what you said before that, uh, it seems to me uh, that, look, you know me pretty well at this point. I'm not anti-mockery, right? Mm -hmm. I, right. I, uh, you know, I, sure. am, I am serially guilty of mocking people. Uh, and there are certainly things in the world that deserve moral condemnation. But the reason not to just respond to the Ben Shapiro's of the world with those tools is... One, uh, then when he makes a ridiculous, spurious argument, like this thing about uh, gender identity and age, uh, if you only respond by, you know, saying that he's a bigot uh, and, you know, making fun of his ridiculous voice and all of that, right. uh, then you have left anybody who's not sure what to think with the impression that we don't actually have a response, that this is such a knockdown argument that, you know, like if we never get around to saying what's wrong with the argument, then people will understandably get the impression that we don't actually have a good response to that argument and we're going to lose winnable people. And then the other problem is that if mockery and moral condemnation are our only tools, then when legitimate um, tactical, strategic or policy differences come up on the left, uh, those are the tools that we're going to turn on each other. And that gets, uh, that gets very a ugly, that gets very alienating. I think a lot of uh, regular people, uh, very understandably, want absolutely nothing to do with left-wing spaces that are like that internally. Right, totally, of course. No, they're super toxic and repulsive. And I think, yeah, and people need to understand when there is actually like a real legitimate range of even really vigorous disagreement, you know, inside context where there actually are legitimate sort of shared political goals and orientations. And I, and I, I just want to use briefly, like this isn't just in the sort of like, you know, okay, like yes, left-wing Twitter is toxic, whatever, like all Twitter is, but this is also like, there's many factors, but one of the reasons that, you know, Podemos, the left-wing party in Spain recently underperformed was because, I mean, there was actually, Spanish police units trying to undermine them in a very disturbing case of political sabotage. So that's a very important thing to cover. But there also was just, and, you know, Nando Vila talks about this, just the sort of typical, almost sort of stereotypical sort of like breakdown of internal left cohesion inside the party and like serious you know, really, really ugly and in some cases clearly unnecessary infighting that undermined uh, significantly their electoral prospects um, for, you know, basically advocating some form of genuine democratic and socialist politics in Spain. Um, so it's a, it's, it matters a lot. Can you then get us into the other big problem? There's disanalogies. Then there's also the is ought distinction. This is something obviously that comes up with a lot in the problems and sloppiness of someone like Sam Harris's thinking. Um, but this kind, yeah. of, but it also gets, I think, really importantly though, because this in a way sort of weaves uh, some of the broader objections that come up. Like, no, of course we can't just, you know, we do need to have other commitments in our reasoning. Um, including like, you know, ethical ones. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and the, yeah, the IDW, who you're writing a book about, all of these guys uh, are, are guilty of making massive logical leaps about this subject, right? You know, I mean, certainly the main, you know, the, 
the core villains, you know, Peterson, Harris, Shapiro, uh, all in their own way do this, right? So when uh, Ben Shapiro says that facts don't care about your feelings, uh, his implication is that the right gets its policy prescriptions from facts, uh, and the, uh, the left gets it from, you know, the way we feel. Uh, and this is, this is a very common, uh, this is a very common idea on the right in general. Uh, and this is, uh, and this is particularly something that all of these guys, uh, in the IDW, uh, have, you know, like just routinely, uh, have problems with. So, uh, this is a distinction that's, uh, made by the, uh, great enlightenment philosopher from Scotland, David Hume, uh, who talks about the uh, the distinction between facts and values uh, is and ought. Uh, and so this is something that logicians sometimes refer to as Hume's Law. It's an actual law of logic that says, basically, that in order for an argument to be valid, in order for the conclusion to follow from the premises, if the conclusion is about right or wrong, good or bad, what we should do, uh, then there has to be a premise like that too, right? You can't go straight from some factual claim uh, to a claim about what we should do. There's always some kind of, any kind of inference like that, there's always some kind of implied uh, value premise, mm-hmm. right? And, and this is something that these guys don't like to talk about, right? You know, they, they like to say, you know, if, for example, right, um, you know, Ben Shapiro is talking about... Um, how, you know, uh, tough, uh, you know, uh, criminal sentencing laws uh, supposedly reduce the crime rate. And, you know, the only reason that people uh, now see, you know, like even Joe Biden now needs, sees the need to run away from this is that, uh, you know, uh, support for getting tough on this is now no longer considered woke, right? He just had an article in the Daily Wire making this claim. Uh, well, you can't go straight from, even if it's true, it's actually an incredibly dubious factual claim, but even if it's true, the causal claim that he's making, nothing follows about whether or not you should actually have these tougher criminal sentencing laws, because there's also this evaluative component, right? Is the only thing that we care about lower crime rates? Uh, do we also care about uh, about the rights of criminal defendants the, you know, uh, that... Uh, do we uh, do we care about uh, civil liberties issues that might be raised by this? Uh, and Sam Harris, as you mentioned, is particularly bad on this because Harris uh, will actually claim that his um, his moral um, his moral beliefs can be directly derived from science, which is just total nonsense, right? Science. You know, facts in general can tell us how to get to the goals we care about, right? Once we decide what to care, what we care about, then, of course, all kinds of factual information can be relevant to how that we can best, most efficiently achieve those goals, right? You know, should we want to care, you know, we want to close the racial wealth gap. Should we just be looking at um, redistributive social programs that are universalist but that disproportionately benefit minorities? Uh, or should we also be advocating reparations uh, if we have real world examples we could point to where either of these policies were tried, then of course that could be relevant to that argument. But first we have to actually have the goal of closing the racial wealth gap, right? So what the facts can tell us is how to achieve the goals we care about. The facts can't tell us which goals to care about in the first place. Right. And even though the people who, who pretend that they can make this huge deal about the rhetoric of logic, you know, logic and facts, facts and logic, logic, facts and evidence. This is actually uh, a logical principle that you actually can't do that. And so how does that actually intersect then with, you know, because we joked, I mean, uh, Matt and I have a bit about how we're, we're uh, what was it? We're going to create the first purely emotionally driven artificial intelligence. It's the <laughs> the left wing robot that cares nothing for facts and logics. It's just emotions, period. But, you know, my understanding, too, and I wonder if this does like if some of the kind of uh, potentially, you know, neuroscience of people like Antonio Damasio maybe potentially reflects you just in the sense that can you even make these hard and fast distinctions between logic and emotion, right? Like, 
that sort of, like to me like you know even outside of these of these political subcultures there's i guess the you know like the kind of like pop culture star trek ideal of well you know there's um what is it uh, uh spock spock can think perfectly logically and, in, and emotion does not interfere but it seems like that as far as we understand in terms of how people actually work as human systems the emotional and logic components are not as divided or as separable as you know somebody might make it in a thought experiment yeah well look uh i've always said star trek has a lot to answer for because it's given generations of television viewers the idea that logic and emotion are somehow in conflict which they're not right so uh it's of course it's possible to be so upset that you can't think straight right right that's obviously you know in the moment right that's obviously possible uh and of course there are lots of reasons you know why there are situations in which it's important to calm down so you can think strategically right. about how to achieve the goals that you care about uh but that doesn't mean that you stop caring about those goals in the first place that doesn't mean that you're no longer emotionally invested in the pursuit of justice uh uh, or, you know, or equality or, you know, any of these things, uh, because if you didn't care about those things in the first place, you know, you wouldn't be, you know, you wouldn't be engaged, uh, in this reasoning. Uh, and of course, um, yeah, I mean, I, it's, it's not that, you know, it's not that you just turn off one part of, you know, one part of your mind while you're doing, you know, while you're, uh, while you're reasoning, even if that were possible, I don't know that that would be desirable, you know, that's, that's really, that's really not the, you know, not the point at all, right? You know, you can, you know, you can care very passionately and appropriately about correcting injustice and also think very clearly about how to get there. Right. Now, and, and, the, but does this also, does this though, at some point, whether we like it or not, loop back to, you know, and I've brought this up with you before. I like the Carol Gilligan example that she did it, you know, her work on spheres of care, right? And and just to you know mm -hmm. simplify it, it, that basically the the sense, and she has a lot of other, you know, th again, there's a lot more to her work. She's she's a brilliant psychologist, but the one simple thing I'll extract for this conversation is like self care, community care, world care, and those sort of like realms of moral imagination sort of correlate with different levels of psychic, you know at least capacity to empathize, capacity to, um, uh, you know, again, just expand your sphere of concern. And it just seems to me like, yes, of course, you know, there's argumentation, there's serious, there's, there's political difference, there's, you know, all of the, but there is this, like, I don't know what the difference between somebody who, you know, sees like a, a homeless encampment in LA or walks by people in sub freezing uh, degrees in New York and then, you know, recognizes that there's hundreds of millions of dollars, you know, penthouses, uh, you know, billions of dollars of real estate that isn't even used and just registers that that's just absolutely morally revolting versus uh, somebody mm -hmm. who either, you know, doesn't notice it or maybe, you know, in the Randian sense has sort of built some type of like, you know, bizarre, horrifying, dystopian counter scenario where that's <laughs> actually really healthy and really just, you know, to me, there, there are just there. Those are expressing different baselines upon which you start an analysis. I don't know. I mean, is that escapable? I mean, again, not that people can't be persuaded, but isn't that the part of it where it's like. I don't want to say they're right because it isn't like a feeling, but it's like you come to things with, you know, a particular sets of convictions really broadly defined. And part of that is going to be, you know, how you relate to that example of like the homeless people versus yeah. the unused real estate. Yeah, no, that's exactly right. Uh, so absolutely. Uh, it is true that, you know, that what you, you start with is that you care about certain outcomes that, you know, uh, that, 
or you know you're bothered by certain realities so you know so you want to correct them uh but of course the important thing to emphasize here uh is that that's just as true for the right as for the left right like, you know it's, yep. it's not that mm-hmm. um it's not that like we care about uh about certain you know certain outcomes and our politics are driven by that but they're somehow you know being driven by you know by facts you know by you know in that in that ridiculous sam harris extreme you know <laughs> that they're uh extrapolating their values from science somehow which is logically impossible anyway uh so that's that's not it right they also have goals that they care about, right? You know, that they have that, like, one of the things that might drive you to uh, that Ayn Rand kind of view is, well, okay, for example, if you are actually Ayn Rand, uh, then I think the fact that, you know, that she, she came from, I think, a fairly well-off family uh, in, in Russia who had their stuff taken away by the Bolsheviks, you know, or certainly at least, you know, uh, I don't know that much about her family background, but, you know, that she she saw this happening and she thought that was morally outrageous, right? You know, like that this is something mm-hmm. that's very, that's like libertarians often tend to come to their politics from a starting point of clearly, you know, it's it's outrageous, it's unjust, you know, it makes me angry that anybody might try to take my stuff or even that anybody might try to take anybody's stuff, right? You know, that like, you know, even if you're, you know, even if you're like the libertarian who, you know, has a working class job, but, you know, has dreams, Horatio Alger dreams or whatever. Right. Uh, so in, um, you know, and then they sort of say, okay, well, they have this moral intuition that that's bad. And then they build, you know, and then they start, they start reasoning about it. Right. And that's not even a criticism, right? Like, I think that they have bizarre alien moral intuitions, you know, from my perspective, you know, that, uh, that I, I think that, I think that, uh, that take, you know, you know, expropriating property so we don't have a society where some people live under bridges and some, you know, nice buildings are remain vacant, you know, because, you know, Russian oligarchs are just using them to park their money, you know, that, uh, that expropriation to fix that would obviously, you know, would clearly be just, uh, but it's inescapable that you start off, uh, with, with some moral intuitions that you start off with some goals that you care about before you can even start to reason about how to achieve those goals. Now, the, uh, people who, who feel absolutely nothing about that scenario that you're describing, you know, the combination of penthouses and homelessness, uh, those are people I'm under no illusions that we can win over, right? right? We're, we're not going to. Uh, and, you know, I, you know, I'm, I'm a socialist. I think that uh, generally speaking, most people who uh, are certainly in the 1%, right? You know, let's just go there. Uh, are with some exceptions, right? But most people who are in that position uh, are going to rationalize the justice of it to themselves. And nothing we say is going to convince them, right? You know, there's, there's no there's no moral argument we can give to Jeff Bezos right. uh, that will lead to him correcting the conditions in Amazon warehouses. You have to fight for that. But the process of fighting for that uh, involves winning over a lot of people who aren't currently leftists and and so some of those people might even be currently swayed, you know, even in complicated centrist ways or just, you know, complicated ways like, you know, the, the sort of guy on the street who doesn't watch the majority report, whose three favorite politicians are Bernie Sanders, you know, Joe Biden and Ron Paul, right. you know, and there's just no, you know, like, but in complicated ways, people uh, do think, you know, they, they do see they do share some of our moral intuitions, but they're also somewhat taken in by some of some of the stuff that the other side says, right? You know, they do think that there's something that is screwed up about the combination of penthouses to homelessness. You know, they're not immune from feeling that, uh, but they sort of, you know, they, they, because they've heard it so much, they sort of think, oh, that wouldn't be okay to take away people's stuff in order to correct it. Uh, and so those are the people I think that you can win. You can't win all of them, but you know, the more of them we can win over, the more successful we're going to be. And that involves, yeah, making arguments, 
But some of those arguments are going to be appealing to their underlying values, you know, like that, hey, you agree that this is really bad, right? Well, you know, which of these is more important to you, that, you know, Jeff Bezos gets to keep his, his fortune or that, like, everybody, uh, you know, everybody can go to the doctor, you know, anytime they right. want to, right? Uh, right. And uh, You should trust your moral this, intuition of the obvious answer to that question. Yeah, exactly. Right. And, you know, and I think that sometimes when people on the right do give sophistical arguments uh, that, um, that you shouldn't right, trust that, uh, if all we're doing is saying they're bad, they're bad, uh, they have really, you know, whiny nasal voices, they're bad, they're bad, uh, then I don't think we're using all of the weapons in our arsenal right. to counter that, right? You know, if, if people, if you can... Sometimes if you can show people, yeah, the reasons they're giving you for thinking that we, we have to accept this actually don't make sense, even on their own terms, you can kind of break it apart. Uh, that's, that doesn't mean that, like, everybody is going to be magically convinced, but, you know, by what you just said, like the reaction, you know, in an Aaron Sorkin TV show to a stirring speech. But it does, you know, but it will get some people thinking, uh, and some of the people who are winnable can be won over that way. Uh, and certainly if, if we don't, if we don't try to show what's wrong with their specious arguments, uh, then we're, we're preemptively surrendering. I think at a front where we really don't need to surrender. I agree with you completely. I just, in the last couple of minutes, um, and this, I will say, I mean, obviously in some ways, this is the sort of center of my book and a much broader, I mean, using the IDW in some ways as a case study to both advocate for a certain kind of synthesis of cosmopolitanism and socialism, globalism and socialism that I care a lot about, but then also more broadly that, uh, you know, and, and this is, I, I don't remember where this uh, quote originated at the moment, but essentially, and plenty of people have made this point, but the distinction between the right as a naturalizing project and the left as a historicizing project. And this is the way in which, by the way, even people who take that very kind of like, you know, internet quiz view of politics where they'll say like, oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> like somebody like, you know, Sam Harris is really, you know, center left because I don't know, I have some quote somewhere where he supported some progressive taxation or something like this. Whereas my argument is that no, like all of these figures are fundamentally on the right. And to me, a big part of just fundamentally being on the right, even if your politics are, you know, I don't know, say, you know, wind up being some version of like a Clintonian Democrat or something, is if your fundamental starting point is that whether it's scientific or religious or mythological, that there are sort of like just these innate truths of things uh, that can't be, you know, altered. Now, obviously, some things do have innate thing, truths of things that can't be altered, and we're not advocating, like, a blank, blank slate view of people, of course. But on the other hand, like, no, there's nothing that's no, set in no, stone. That's, that's, of, that's not the plan, that majority report year one? No. Oh, well, I mean, yes. That's more TMBS year one. Okay. But, I mean... Even, I mean, okay. that's not a blank okay. slate view. That's just a year one view, but that's another conversation. <laughs> but, uh, you know, but that, you know, there's nothing organic or innate about an extreme income inequality or anything like that. Or really, you know, that, 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 and by the way, that's another disanalogy, right? Like, no, is everybody mm -hmm. going to have the same uh, height or ability to like play basketball well or tennis well? No. Does that get transferred to, therefore, some people are going to have billions of dollars of assets and other people starve? <laughs> no. That's actually a really ludicrous, horrifying disanalogy. But um, that being said, you know, and, and I sort of center it in the exchange that, you know, when Sam Harris was really going to bat for the bell curve and... Uh, advocating what I would certainly deem to be both within the field, but also more broadly, you know, discredited and racist IQ stuff. Uh, he, in his debate with Ezra Klein, and Ezra Klein of all people is saying, look, I mean, historically, we have a lot of examples of basically European guys sitting down and saying, you know, we've uh, devised a quote unquote objective system that shows that we're the best. Like, who would have thunk it? Uh, and Harris, I'll paraphrase, you know, he got, you know, got very triggered and basically said the history was, I believe the word was irrelevant, if I recall correctly. And, you know, to yep. me, I can't think of anything 
including a lot of, uh, you know, actually really bad, like neoliberal and woke takes I don't like, where I don't think the history is anything other than probably the most relevant. So where does that kind of, you know, not allowing them to also not only misuse logic, but use logic as like, no, we're never going to talk about anything real. We're only going to do sort of like extended mind games with each other. So we're never going to actually talk like we'll do sort of like our read of popular science and economics, maybe, and then a bunch of imaginative yeah. exercises. But we're going to leave, ironically, the entire empirical playing field almost always. Um, you know, Shapiro's different. Shapiro obviously kind of gives more of those sort of 1950s kind of view of history. But in general, that, you know, that comment, the history is irrelevant. Uh, to historical inquiry um, or unimportant uh, to to logical exchange. W what's the answer to that, to bring history and context to logic and facts? Yeah, uh, so I'd say that a lot of that is just a category mistake that you know people, a lot of the people who most valorize logic on the right give you the impression that caring a lot about logic means that you try to like derive everything from like three first principles but of course that there's there's absolutely nothing about caring about good reasoning that dictates that attitude and in fact i would argue that caring about good reasoning should be that you don't go there right because uh, oftentimes there is going to be a clear logical relationship uh between some you know, political uh, claims, some, you know, like some attempt to apply a moral principle to politics uh, and historical facts, sociological facts. And a historical argument is an argument. A sociological argument is an argument. If you want to reason well, if the goal of reasoning is to figure out the truth, then you should be looking at anything that might be relevant to help it figure it out. And it's often very revealing uh, because just to take an obvious example of, of a case where uh, the, the history is, is very relevant, right? We were talking earlier about libertarians who think that it's just wrong in principle to take away any of, you know, like Jeff Bezos has a moral right to every cent in his bank account, uh, and, you know, and, and it's just stealing. If you, take, uh, if you take any of it away for, you know, redistributed programs, for example, uh, and that you know, it, then you sort of interrogate them a little bit. And you say, well, okay, but why? Right? And of course, they can't say because the ideal way that a society should be, right? The, the thing that we should really hope to end up at is some people have billions of dollars and can talk to their senator anytime they want to. And some people are working all day in the warehouse if they're even lucky enough to have a job. Right. Uh, because even they wouldn't say that like that's the that's the ideal end state that we would aim at. So what they end up saying is that, well, we should uh, as long as things came about in the right way, right? As long as you weren't um, you weren't violating anybody's rights, uh, you uh, you know this it all came about through a free market, what the libertarian philosopher Robert Nozick calls capitalistic acts between consenting adults then no matter how unequal the outcome is, it's okay. But then, of course, the obvious response is, but wait a second, that's not what happens, right? Like, uh, even, you know, even in Europe, capitalism emerged from feudalism uh, and, you know, with this massive process of enclosure and people being forced off their lands, they had to work in factories. And that's pretty cozy and consensual compared to what happened in the New World, where capitalism was literally built up by the labor of slaves on land stolen from genocide victims. Uh, and strangely enough, though, a lot of the same people who will use this kind of libertarian argument, whatever end state you end up with is cool as long as it comes out the right way, suddenly go all Sam Harris, the history is irrelevant, when you start bringing up how it actually came about. Right, right. Right. Or, or, you know, again, not to, not to, to, uh, to bring up another example, but I remember, you know, you in an exchange with, I don't, I don't remember some, some, some YouTube channel kind of saying like, well, actually, you know, Richard Wolf as an example, his ideas of workplace democracy, uh, we actually have a lot of examples of co-op models being very effective, whether we're talking about Madrigone in Spain or Cleveland in Ohio. And, you 
the guy you were debating sort of went from like saying like, well, that's just the most ridiculous idea in the world that you could have a bottom up workplace to, oh, okay, all right, I don't, I don't, please, enough with the examples yeah, of yeah, actual was, things happening. Yeah, the, I would like to get back the, to my yeah, assertion. The, the phrase was, was let's, let's not get into the weeds. Yeah, no, it was last place you'd want to get. <laughs> uh, certainly, yeah, right. again, ironically for like the whole empiricism gang. So ironically, I guess I leave these conversations I usually do with you with this sort of horrifying realization that I'm a nerd. Because <laughs> I like to actually talk about well, real you know, shit. Keep, keep wearing the track suits. It disguises it well. Thank you very much. I, sh- I shall. Penn Burgess, the book is Give Them an Argument, Logic for the Left. It's available on pre-order from Zero Books. It's an excellent book. And obviously, go check out his books on the, his, uh, art, his videos on the Zero Books channel. You can hear him on uh, TMBS. He's actually going to be the guest on TMBS this coming Tuesday. You can also hear him. Uh, you're going to be on Ralph Nader's podcast, right? Uh, yeah, I don't know when the podcast actually airs. Uh, I think it's a pre-record, but I'm going to uh, record that on uh, May 29th, so just before the book comes out. Awesome, and you're you're on a lot with the great David Feldman. Everybody, check out David Feldman's podcast. I love that podcast. Uh, ben, is there going to be an audio book? I hope so. Uh, I have I have talked with uh, with Doug, uh, our editor at Zero Books, about that. Uh, and and he he wants to do it. It's not planned yet. There's going to be a paper book and an e-book on the 31st, and I hope at some point thereafter there's going to be an audio book. Cool. Yeah, that's the only way Matt's going to read it. No, I might buy the Kindle version. <laughs> I have the actual paperback book, and it's very. It's also the cover art of David Hume in a in a powdered wig shushing ben shapiro is one of the funniest things i've seen in quite some time it's extremely yeah, good uh, shout out to uh shout out to ryan lake uh who is a um philosophy professor uh, at georgia state and um and he's also a uh, does a, a regular uh, philosophy themed web comic called chaos pet who's the person who drew that cover art well it's a great work and i'd also just like to say in in the spirit of this more expansive kind of wrapping up Ben and uh, and others like him are another prime reason why uh, the capitalist classes want to completely drain all funding from any type of humanities or social science in public education because kids should well, be being I mean, terrorized sure. to work in a factory or if they have any talent, you know, like producing weapons. Oh, yeah. Critical thinking not needed for the economy of the future. Not good. <laughs> Don't like well, that. I'm sure you saw. I'm sure you saw uh, Bolsonaro. Uh, wants to uh, cut off all state funding to philosophy and sociology departments in Brazil. Yep, I sure did. You got to protect Western civilization. Got to protect Western civilization for people who can think. <laughs> uh, ben Burgess, everybody order the book, give them an argument, logic for the left. Ben, thanks so much. All right, thanks so much yeah, for having me on. Appreciate it. Seriously, guys, it's a really great book.